Welcome to a brief presentation on cultural engagement and cultural competence in interprofessional collaborative practice. My name is Diane Elsey and I'm an associate professor at the UB School of Social Work and I direct the MSW program. In this very brief presentation, I want to give you an overview of important constructs that we should be familiar with when we discuss cultural engagement and cultural competence. So what is culture? Now please know that there are many different definitions of culture. Here are a couple of very good definitions of culture. Culture may include, but is not limited to, our racial ethnic background, our national origin, our geographical location, our age, sex, gender, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation, our religious or spiritual beliefs, our political beliefs, our professional identities, our socioeconomic class, our ability or disability status. Culture includes our art, literature, and history, our language. Culture is a system of shared values, beliefs, and learned patterns of behavior. Through our culture, we view and interpret the world. Our cultural lens influences how we interpret people's behaviors and how we interact with people. It is clear that our cultural beliefs, thoughts, and attitudes can influence our interactions with our patients, our clients, and with our team members. You are probably familiar with most of these terms. I have prepared another brief presentation for you that will be very helpful to you in understanding how our perceptions and assumptions operate in our day-to-day -day lives, especially with our patients or clients and people who may be culturally different from us. And I will be giving you a very helpful strategy for avoiding assumptions and for expressing curiosity about the behavior of your patient, client, or team member. So let's take a brief look at one of these terms right now, cultural identity. Our personal cultural identity is comprised of multiple levels, individual, group, and universal. We may share cultural beliefs and values with other members of our culture and subcultures, the group level. But we may also be unique in many ways, the individual level. Because we are all human beings, we also share common life experiences, such as births, deaths, love, sadness, happiness, and the use of language, the universal level. Although different cultures may attribute different meanings, beliefs, and values to these life experiences. Our perceived and actual group memberships exert powerful influences on our lives because attached to them are societal systems of power and privilege that are embedded in our social, cultural, political, and economic institutions. Please pause the presentation and take a few moments to reflect on one or more of these questions. When you think about the people who raised you, what was one major message you received from them regarding your cultural background and identities? What was a major message that you received from the larger society about your cultural background? What are some perceptions, stereotypes, and assumptions that healthcare providers may make about you because of your cultural background? So far, what does all this mean for us as service providers? It means that we need to leave our assumptions at the door and be curious about the experiences and worldviews of our patients, clients, and team members. It means that we need to actively and sensitively engage with our patients and clients about their cultural beliefs, values, and traditions especially beliefs about their health, their illness, what caused their illness, how their illness affects them, and what type of treatment they think they should receive. Because different aspects of people's cultures exert a powerful influence in how they think, feel, behave, view events, view other people, and make decisions they may also exert a powerful influence in how people define
the helping relationship, the relationship between themselves and their health care provider. And their view of the helping relationship may be very different than our view of that relationship. There are many definitions of cultural competence that exist in the literature. These are three that I find helpful. The first definition is the one used by the Association of American Medical Colleges in their 2005 publication, Cultural Competence Education for Medical Students. Terry Cross, a licensed clinical social worker, educator, and member of the Seneca Nation of Indians, is the current director of the National Indian Child Welfare Association. He has over four decades of experience in creating culturally competent systems of care for children and their families. In 1989, he published with colleagues a groundbreaking monograph that identified principles for creating a culturally competent system of care for children of color with severe emotional disturbance, the principles of which apply to other service systems as well. This work is still widely cited today. The National Center for Cultural Competence out of Georgetown University's Center for Child and Human Development uses Cross's definition and emphasizes that cultural competence is a developmental process that evolves over time for both individuals and for organizations. The National Association of Social Workers defines cultural competence as a process by which individuals and service systems such as health and mental health care, respond effectively, sensitively, and respectfully to people in all their diversities in ways that affirm and value them as individuals and as members of families and communities. In the health professions, the word competence usually means that we have mastered the knowledge and skills necessary to perform a particular task. It implies a static endpoint. Cultural competence, however, is not a static endpoint. We never arrive at being totally culturally competent. We should think about it as a lifelong developmental process in which we are continually engaged, a never-ending process of becoming more culturally competent. Cultural competence involves a commitment to and active engagement in a lifelong process with ourselves, with patients and clients, with communities, and with our colleagues. As healthcare providers, we must be committed to self-assessment, critical thinking, active engagement, and reflective practice. Self-reflection means realistic and ongoing self-appraisal and self-critique. Reflective practice leads to an increased level of self-awareness and awareness of other cultural perspectives. Culturally competent healthcare provision is a social justice issue. As healthcare providers, it is critically important for us to be aware of the differences in power and privilege and the inequities that are embedded in social relationships in our society and to reorient our perspective towards a commitment to social justice. Tremendous disparities continue to exist in our country in health and mental health care based on race and ethnicity especially and based on education and income, gender, geographic location, and disability status. These disparities include disparities in access to care, quality of care, and the onset prevalence and severity of negative health outcomes. Some practitioners prefer the term cultural humility because it does not imply an endpoint the way the word competence does. Humility is an important stance for healthcare providers to take. We must be humble enough to let go of preconceived notions. We must be humble enough to assess anew the cultural dimensions of the experiences of each patient. We must be humble enough to relinquish the role of expert to our patient and become the student of the patient in order to understand how the patient experiences his or her illness and wellness. We must be humble enough to diminish the power imbalances that exist between healthcare provider and patient 
by being patient focused in our interviewing and care. And we must be humble enough to say that we do not know when we do not know, and then to search for new knowledge and insights. However, these ideas of ongoing commitment, self-reflection, lifelong learning, and active engagement have been integrated into our definitions and understandings of cultural competence. Linguistic competence is a key component of cultural competence. It is important that we look at whether our services are delivered in the preferred language and mode of delivery of the populations we serve. The lack of interpreter services and culturally and linguistically appropriate health education materials has been associated with patient dissatisfaction, ineffective and lower quality care, and patients' lack of understanding of their diagnosis, prescribed medications, special instructions, and plans for follow-up care. When we talk about linguistic competence, we are not just talking about the availability of foreign language interpretation services, but also the availability of print materials that are easy to read for people with low literacy, sign language interpretation services for people who use sign language, materials that have been developed and tested for specific cultural groups, and many other strategies. Please take a look at the handout in this module called Definitions of Linguistic Competence from the National Center for Cultural Competence. You will see in that handout an extensive list of organizational practices that increase the capacity of an organization and its personnel to communicate effectively with diverse clientele. Before we end this presentation, I would like you to reflect very carefully on the following. Please put yourself in the role of a patient. Think about going to a new healthcare provider for the very first time, and you are very fearful that something is very wrong with your health. If a healthcare professional was practicing cultural humility with you as their patient, what might you notice in their verbal and nonverbal interactions with you? Please be as specific as possible. And that brings us to the end of this brief PowerPoint presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. A reference list follows.